Throughout history, several companies have had problems with people disrupting the trade of goods and services, and a lot of companies have taken matters into their own hands with defending against these people. Welcome to episode 20 of Dylan Explains Everything. My name's Dylan, in case you couldn't tell by the title, I'm the one explaining everything, including the topic of today, companies that had armies. So why do companies have armies? Well, for most cases, it's because there are things like pirates or raiders who will disrupt their trading and distributing of their products. But in some cases, it's just because they want to have an army. The first company to really start this was the East India Company, which had one main job, to exploit trade across Southeast Asia in modern day China, Malaysia, and Indonesia for Britain. This all started because of something called the East India Spice Trade, which basically was when Spain and Portugal had a monopoly on trading spice in Southeast Asia. So in 1588, that ended when Britain defeated the Spanish Armada. The actual company started in 1600 with a royal charter from the Queen, allowing two men to start the company in India. They would go in, take an amount of territory, set up trading posts, and then leave people behind to run the trading posts. Eventually, they moved on from just selling spices to selling more luxury goods like silk, tea, fabrics, and other types of very expensive items, which made a huge profit. Of course, other countries weren't too jazzed about this new company that was taking over the East Indies. In fact, Portugal and the Dutch East Indies, or modern day Indonesia, were both completely against Britain doing this, which of course didn't stop them. This led to, in 1623, the Dutch executing a bunch of English, Japanese, and Portuguese traders in something called the Amboina Massacre. Then, Dutch stopped trade with all countries. This didn't stop the company, though, because earlier, in 1612, the company was actually able to defeat Portugal in most of India, allowing them to gather the goods that Portugal was using, and set up trade posts with the Mughal Empire, which is in modern-day northern India and Pakistan. You may have noticed that I actually said that the company defeated Portugal. Basically, because of the royal charter, the company was able to set up their own army and defeat countries and wage war on people as if it was its own country. Their access to the Mughal Empire allowed them to trade spices for cotton, silk, indigo, and many other luxury goods, expanding their near monopoly even more and making a huge profit. During the early 1620s, the company also started one of its biggest businesses, slavery. It captured slaves from Indonesia, Western Africa, and most commonly Eastern Africa, moving them to certain ports in India or Indonesia, and then transporting them elsewhere, which just expanded their profits even more. Slavery was booming during the 1730s and 50s, but it ended during 1780. And because of the declining cotton sales starting in the 50s, the company had to find a new way to get a lot of money, so they took Bengal from the Mughals. Robert Clive, the leader of an army of about 3,000 men, took over the area and he became its governor, allowing taxes to be collected in order to help the East India Company. And then the East India Company was actually able to use that to form more armies and kick the French and Dutch completely out of India. In order to do this, Britain basically started a huge trend of annexing territory and making deals with leaders in India to not take over their territory, getting tons of money and taxes and land, just establishing Britain even more in India. At its peak, the company had 260,000 people in its army, or double what Britain's standing army at the time was. And the company was said to be responsible for about half of Britain's trade at the time. It even had its own government-like system. Then the decline started around the 18th century, where Britain started trading opium to China in exchange for tea. This was a problem for China though, as they started having huge outbreaks of people getting addicted to opium, so they stopped the import, which just made the company find new ways of sneaking opium into China. In fact, a theory has actually been made based on the fact that Britain often snuck opium with tea shipments into America in order to be smuggled into China. 
The theory is based on the Sons of Liberty, a partially Freemasonic secret society led by Samuel Adams. The theory is that the Boston Tea Party, which was started by the Sons of Liberty, was actually a plot to get opium in a tea shipment that was going into America, not just to throw tea out of a ship. If you'd like to hear about this theory and more about the Sons of Liberty, let me know in the comments below and I'll do a video about it. Anyways, the illegalization of British opium in China started a huge war between Britain and China. The first opium war was held between 1839 and 1842, which resulted in a British win, allowing them to have increased trade privileges with China. Of course, China didn't like losing, so they started another war called the Era War, which was held between 1856 and 1860, in which China lost again, allowing Europe to have more trading privileges with them. This was also the time that the company started to die out. Basically, Parliament in Britain realized that they should have some political power over the company, even though the company was acting pretty much independently. So Parliament started making political decisions for the company. And then shareholders in the company realized that they should have economic power over the decisions that the East India Company was making, meaning that the East India Company lost both their economic and political freedom. The decline was actually starting in 1813 when the company lost its monopoly in East India. And then it continued in 1834 when it lost all of its independent powers. And then 1857 when it had an Indian mutiny destroying a lot of the trade. Then it dissolved in 1873. Next up, I'm gonna talk about a pop that all of you, or at least most of you have heard of, Pepsi. I don't drink pop anymore, but back when I did, I always drank Pepsi over Coke. But I don't care about flavor now, I want to learn about its history. And boy is there a lot to talk about. I'm not going to be diving into the history of Pepsi as a whole because frankly that's a topic for another day, but I will be talking about how Pepsi stopped a war between the US and the Soviet Union, how it started trading vodka, and how Pepsi became the world's sixth largest navy in one day. During 1959, President Eisenhower wants to show the Soviet Union how the US's capitalism system is better than communism. President Eisenhower starts the American National Exhibit in the Soviet Union, which basically spreads American culture and promotes capitalism. So then Vice President Nixon decides to go and attend the opening. Nixon and the Soviet leader Khrushchev start debating their economic ideologies, capitalism versus communism, and things start getting pretty heated. The vice president of Pepsi runs in before things can get too heated and hands Khrushchev a Pepsi. Khrushchev tries it and likes it so much that he actually strikes a deal in 1972 with Pepsi. The USSR wanted Pepsi, but they wouldn't let their currency go out of the country, and even if they did, it would be pretty worthless. So they struck a deal with Pepsi. Every bottle of Pepsi that they got, they'd give a bottle of Russian vodka in return, which was highly valuable at the time. Pepsi saw a huge opportunity for profit, so they accepted the deal and set up a bunch of factories in the USSR to sell Pepsi right there. And business was booming, it was going great, but a lot changed in 1979. The USSR invaded Afghanistan. This was a pretty big deal, so tensions between the USA and the USSR started rising, and people started boycotting Soviet goods and companies that traded with the Soviets, which caused a huge problem for Pepsi. So Pepsi basically had a huge stockpile of vodka just sitting there, and the price of vodka started going down, nonetheless Russian vodka, which was hugely disliked. So in 1989, Pepsi made a new deal with the Soviet Union. Pepsi continued making Pepsi in the Soviet Union in exchange for 17 Soviet submarines, a Soviet frigate, a cruiser, and a destroyer, totaling 20 Soviet ships, making Pepsi the world's sixth largest navy. This meant that PepsiCo had actually disarmed the Soviets quicker than America had. Shortly after, though, all the ships were sold to a Norwegian scrapping company in exchange for $3 billion. This deal actually started a lot of turmoil in the U.S. as people were pointing out how the U.S. wasn't doing anything about the invasion of Afghanistan and how they were just kind of sitting there while the Soviet Union was getting more and more powerful. Of course, the deal with Pepsi ended when the Soviet Union dissolved a little while later. 
Still, Pepsi did at one point have the world's sixth largest navy, and this was the first time that a private company had made a deal with a foreign country in exchange for weaponized vessels. This also goes to show how companies can be just as powerful as governments, and just because someone doesn't have political power doesn't mean they don't have military power. I mean, think about what would have happened if Pepsi had actually used those ships on the government. With all that being said, I hope you enjoyed today's video just as much as Soviets like Pepsi, and if you did, be sure to let me know, and stick around for my next video, which always comes out Saturday at 10 a.m., and if you have any thoughts, questions, or suggestions, be sure to leave them in the comments below, and remember, my name's Dylan, and I explain everything.